Hello and welcome everyone to this PalmSense webinar. Uh, this is the second part of our field effect transistor webinar where we talk with you about how to use field effect transistors for sensor applications. As you can see on the screen, I'm Lutz Stratmann, but I'm not alone here. Again, I'm going to host this webinar together with my colleague Artie. Um, who is, uh, who's going to be your voice for the chat. So the last time we introduced to you concept of using field effect transistor together with potentiostats or using potentiostat for the characterization of field effect transistors. And palm sensely we ask ourselves, is that possible with our potentiostats? And we partnered up with the Institute of Physical Chemistry of the Polish Academia of Sciences. And we focused our project at the moment on the Amstead Pico module, which is OEM potentiostat module. And you see at the bottom, the question is Amstead Pico plus field effect transistor based sensor, does that work, yes or no? So we started the presentations by explaining you what is a field effect transistor and how does it work? That was then done by Mark Chin, who's also going to do the, sec uh, the main part of this webinar. He also introduced transferred and output curves as different ways to characterize field effect transistors. And he showed you different types of field effect transistors. So the classic MOSFET ones, metal oxide, the EG, which stands for extended gate, the IS for ion selective, and the G for graphene fat. Also, the, la the last one will be one that is discussed today. And then uh, he demonstrated also the Amstead Pico for a pH sensor that's using an ECFET, so an extended gate field effect transistor. So for us, it was clear, yes, you can use the Amstead Pico for field effect transistors. And it was shown a bit in more detail how that was done. Also what was shown was, then that would go get more in Marcin's work, which was first field effect transistors versus potentiometry, where Marcin basically compared them and concluded that field effect transistors deliver basically amplified potentiometry. He showed one basic problem of uh, field effect transistors with, for biosensors, and that is that um, the um, the bi length is very important for these sensors. So how far does a biorecognition event still influence the electric field in the field effect transistors? And he pointed out that this depends on multiple factors and showed examples how you can, for example, uh, engineer your surface uh, in different ways that you will still get a good signal with a field effect transistor as your transducer. Um, that was all shown at the example of a thyroid stimulating hormone sensor. And yeah, and Martin gave uh, already very good uh, examples that you also have a feel, feeling for what applications are out there for this. Okay, and I would say this is enough for the recap from last time. I leave the floor to Martin, who can show us now more about the exciting work he does. For example, with graphene field effect transistors and other more advanced field effect transistors. Hi, uh, welcome again. So today we'll talk about a little bit more advanced systems. We'll cover today the multiplexing a little bit with the instruments that Palmsense provides. This is a MSAT Pico Max. And we're also going to tackle a little bit today the topic of graphene field effect transistors. And since the graphene's discovery in 2004, there has been even in, in comic already. And we'll talk a little bit about the organic electrochemical transistors, which have a little bit different mechanism of work, and then they are still very interesting to work at. Again, a little bit uh, about myself. My name is Marcin Szymon Filipiak. I'm a Polish scientist working in Warsaw, Poland. I graduated from microbiologics in, from Warsaw University of Technology, and then physical chemistry from Heidelberg University. And um, at the moment, I'm doing the MBA studies at the Warsaw School of Economics. I've been working in a biomedics institute, which was sponsored kindly by Roche Diagnostics. There I learned a lot about um, the needs and, and challenges of the industry. And right now, for the last two and a half years, I'm at the Institute of Physical Chemistry of Polish Academy of Sciences, and I'm doing my own um, research projects, um, for example, in collaboration with Palmsense here. So without further ado, um, let's talk about a little bit the, the MUX16 um, instruments and its application in, in the research I, I perform. 
So um, this MSAT Pico Max uh, is basically a two-channel potentiostat or a bipotentiostat. This is based on this MSAT Pico module. Uh, what is the, um, interesting in here is that there is a multiplexing unit here added. So in principle, it, uh, it, it allows for changing the working electrodes, reference electrodes, and counter electrodes. You can get up to 16, uh, so to say, channels in that configuration. And there are two modes of operation possible. Uh, there's, um, this is a simple scheme of how the measuring band could be done. This is number of channel, and this is the number of the measurement point. And in the consecutive mode, we perform the whole measurement for a single channel, and then we go to the second channel and perform the whole measurement for the second channel, and so on and so forth. Or we have this so-called alternating mode, which switches the channels in between um, the, the measurement points. So you first measure the first point of the first channel, first point of the second channel, and so on and so forth. And then you uh, change it to the um, second measurement point of the first channel and so on and so forth. This has a little bit um, influence on how the measurements can be done. Um, I will talk about it in, in a second. So uh, to use the, the to show that uh, multiplexed sensing with the Amstrad Pico Max, I used again the very simple um, case of a um, extended gate um, field effect transistor configuration as shown here. Again, a commercially available MOSFET is MOSFET's gate is connected to a external uh, piece of, of conducting um, material. In, in this case, this is a gold um, electrode immersed in the uh, liquid where the um, reference electrode is immersed um, as well. Uh, this is a rather complicated, but um, if I walk you through it, um, um, rather simple, uh, it, it will appear simple to you, um, scheme. So we connect the sources through the multiplexing unit here uh, to the counter and reference electrode of the MSAT Pico module. And then again, the all the drains are connected to each other and all the gates are uh, also connected to each other. So we basically switch just the sources, keeping the, um, the source drain and, and the um, gate voltage um, always um, applied. So again, we mux, uh, we mux it in a such a way, 16 um, sources, 16 drains that are connected to one electrode and then one reference electrode. And again, this is method script controlled, which is very convenient and, and allows for a lot of flexibility. And it's not that difficult in here. So what you can see in here is a 46 uh, lines of code where at least first 10 are um, basically common to every single method script. So there's no really difficulty in, in developing that. And again, PalmSense provides very nice, um, very nice feedback uh, for that. So this script here changes the, the max address uh, basically digital uh, address of in a, in a max unit and then changes the channel accordingly. This is in a consecutive mode for now. How does it look like in reality? Well, we have a dedicated, I have the dedicated measurement board with 16 MOSFETs already soldered to the board here. So this is uh, in a, uh, on a PCB here with a flat band cable, all the MOSFETs are um, under some kind of a Faraday's cage, and then they are connected to the MSAT Pico Max. Um, unfortunately, I needed a little bit of, of, of changing the, the, um, the pitch size, but this is fairly easy, just, just connecting. Uh, it, it's in an in a, uh, improvised way. And then we have also this, this standardized, I have the standardized sample where I have those 16 uh, fingers eight in here, eight and eight in here, that they are immersed in the in the liquid uh, liquid well um, electrochemical cell in here. So let's see how the alternating and consecutive mode 
uh, looks like this is a transfer curve here for um, the two, uh, two measurements, one made with a, in a consecutive mode and one made with the alternating mode. The alternating is, is green and the consecutive is, is red. Uh, the IG you can see in here is the, um, is the gate current. Uh, this is the so-called leakage current. And, is, um, and it's um, the, the MOSFET itself is, is dependent, is giving this, this um, leakage current to the measurement. Uh, this measurement here was done in a Faraday's cage. This was one of the first measurements that I, I did in a Faraday's cage with those um, FETs in here. Um, I personally don't like it because it, it, it makes your life a little bit more complicated, but it gives you a little bit more um, nice and, and clean results. And using the Faraday's cage, I would like to point out that in here, uh, we're reaching below uh, single nano amps of, of current um, resolution and, and, and current um, accuracy. So that's very, very nice for this, this um, system. Um, so basically the uh, consecutive alternating uh, measurement, as you can see from those curves here, there's a little bit of artifacts in, in the middle, but they do not differ that much from themselves in, 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 in at least in the transfer curve, um, transfer curve um, characterization. Um, after that, after just checking that it all works nice and, and fun and games, uh, we went to more uh, proof of concept studies where we simply um, tried to modify the surface of the gold electrode uh, with the BSA solution. The BSA is bovine serum albumin. It's an inner protein that adsorbs to the surfaces um, very easily. And uh, this is a result for in here. Uh, this is a, a result actually for, for a single extended gate FET. Uh, we generate normally 16 times this uh, piece of data. So to in order to Analyze it. We're using the Python scripts. Very easy. Just just reading out some some values from a uh, from a lots of, of loads of data. So what we can see in here is the transfer curve shift uh, for the BSA modified electrode. We can see that uh, we made the measurement with a Burr electrode, immersed the electrode with the BSA in here, and then measured again. And we can see that the the whole Subthreshold region, I mean, the whole curve actually shifted uh, to more negative potentials. Uh, we also performed a um, more advanced measurement here with um, some tile self assembled monolayer. And this is the result basically. So, what happens here is that the green line is the bare um, gold electrode that was then modified with tile chemistry. Uh, to and then, and then the curve shifted to more negative potentials, and then again the the surface was exposed to BSA, and we see a little bit less um, shift um, because the, the surface was already occupied with the tile um, tile bound um, alkyne, um, alkenes. So now let's make some some uh, readout. Uh, for example, for one microamp, uh, so in here, we read out the gate voltages and we can also put them into um, a nice table and change uh, and check uh, how, how well does the interaction with the contents of the, of the sample shift the transfer curve. So in here, we, we see already a relative difference between the gate voltage for one microamp for bare device and the BSA modified device as well. Uh, in, so this is a about 190 millivolts uh, when it comes to, uh, sorry, this is the, the, the functionalization with, with um, the Mercapto alkane, uh, Mercapto alkane. And this is the modification with the uh, bare, mod bare uh, electrode. And this is after um, absorption on, on the bare um, gold. So basically what we can say from here that multiplexed uh, biosensing with a miniaturized potential set is definitely possible. And then you can get with a MUX uh, device, you can get 16 times more 
uh, more data, that means that you can do some, some statistics. Um, I mentioned already that the time measurement uh, um, in a previous seminar, uh, in here we're, we're making the time measurement in a multiplexed format. So again, this is um, bare gold surface. And then in the middle of experiment, we're adding some BSA to get this, this, this here uh, BSA modified surface. Uh, we keep the gate voltage constant and the source stream, gate, uh, source stream voltage constant as well. And we, we monitor the current um, of source stream in time. This is for 16 devices. Uh, the, the magnitudes of current do not match uh, that, that, uh, with each other that um, closely, but they present the same uh, trend. And if we were to normalize them, they will show the same statistical um, result for 16 devices. Uh, so that proves that the ECFET, uh, ECFETs in, in, in this experiment do react with, uh, to the change of the electrolyte composition um, and that the max, uh, the MSAT Pico max 16 is suitable for those experiments. Uh, a little conclusion for this part, we made some, some surface modification and made some characteristics of the field effect transistors uh, we then tested some BSA adsorption, and this was limited due to the uh, previous tile adsorption. Uh, we also made some time-dependent measurements, so it's it's you can monitor your your binding event in real time. And again, the MSAT Pico Max allows for multiplex for now 16 times FED measurements. Now let's get to the more fancy part, which is the graphene field effect transistors. Um, we'll be talking about these so-called electrolyte-gated field effect transistors here because the MSAT Pico allows uh, to measure those. So graphene itself is a honeycomb lattice. Um, you can imagine it like, like this. All those here are carbon atoms in a single um, sheet of, of, of uh, graphene. Uh, there is some advanced physics behind it. What you need to know is that there's some very high symmetry and that there's this honeycomb lattice and all the atoms are hybridized with um, sp2 hybridization and the, they, they are bonded with the sigma bonds and then each, um, each atom has an unpaired pi electron which allows for some, ele uh, some interesting electronic effects. For example, using a, the graphene single sheet as the um, as the field effect transistor. Uh, again, it has also high conductivity and high mechanical resistance, and it also has this so-called zero band gap uh, behavior, semiconductor with ambipolar uh, behavior. Uh, sometimes we call it a semi-metal. Um, how it's prepared is that we grow graphene on copper foil with some CVD process in a furnace in, in very um, high temperature, feeding the, the furnace with some uh, carbon source. And uh, then the graphene is, uh, react, uh, I mean, the, the carbon reacts with the copper, which is a, the catalyst and forms a monolayer of graphene on the surface. And then we can spin coat it to, to protect the graphene, um, etch away the copper and then transfer it to for example, the polymer. Um, I'm buying personally this so-called uh, trivial transfer graphene pieces, which are actually uh, transferred pieces of graphene covered with PMMA onto some hydrogel. And upon addition of water, they release and you can easily cut them and fish them onto your substrate of choice. Um, after the, the fishing, we, Fishing is, is made on those uh, samples. In here, I use just the two in, inside electrodes. Those were used for multiplexing. Now I'm using just those, those two, which gives me a GFET of about 9.6 millimeters square uh, with a width to length ratio of about 12. And what you can see in here is the Soxlet extraction process uh, where I clean the graphene out of. PMA, PMMA traces. This is done in a, in a Soxlet extractor so that the graphene is constantly cleaned with 
freshly distilled acetone. And after, after getting out the, the samples from the Soxlet extractor, you can see here um, just two points uh, measurement of, of conductivity with a multimeter. Uh, and you can see that the samples made in a very manual way are highly reproducible and can be used further. So uh, in here, we use the single sheet graphene on the hydrogel substrate upon addition of water. It's released, then we fished it, uh, put it into the succulent extractor, got rid of the PMMA, and we're ready to, um, to measure some electrolyte uh, gated field effect transistors. So uh, comparing the electrolyte gated uh, FETs with the classical MOSFET, uh, as we see in here, uh, we see that there is a dielectric insulator on top of the semiconducting channel in here and uh, uh, below the, the gate, so to say. Uh, the gate is placed on the insulator and the usually the voltage is abo above 10 volts or, or um, applied, although it varies from MOSFET to MOSFET, obviously. And in the electrolyte gated configuration, we have the semiconducting channel directly in contact with the electrolyte and then what um, serves as our, um, as our dielectric is the electric double layer at the semiconductor electrolyte interface. And then the direct absorption of charged species on the surface of the channel gives um, a direct um, addition to, uh, to the um, current voltage characteristics of, a, of the FET, which yields higher sensitivity in principle. So how it's done with the with the MSAT Pico? Uh, again, we have this this uh, MSAT Pico here. We connect the source uh, to one of the gold electrodes uh, that is connected to the graphene um, single sheet here. The other one is the drain here connected to the working electrodes one, the second channel of the MSAT Pico, um, and then the working electrodes uh, uh, from the first channel is uh, connected to the AGAGC electrode that is immersed in the, in the electrolytes. Uh, this is how it looks in reality. We here have the MSTAT Pico development um, kit here that I simply connected the, with the uh, jumper wires. And then there's a, a AGAGCL electrode inserted in, in here. And this is again, uh, the very simple method script so some of the parts are already familiar for you, um, I believe, and, and there is no point to, to be worried about um, complex scripting language and so on. The, the sole measurement in here is from line 20 to, um, I would say, 30, 33. So it's very, very simple measurement script and allows for, for measuring of the, um, of the transfer characteristics in this case. Uh, this is a scheme of, of how we measure it. We apply the source string uh, voltage and measure the current in between, and we modulate the source string voltage with the gate potential. Uh, in this experiment, we we're, we're showing how the um, how the pi pi stacking on top of graphene works. Pi pi stacking is a is a method of of surface modification or maybe like like interaction. Uh, where we use the um, conjugated pi um, electrons from, from um, aromatic rings, for example, that interact with each other and then allows for, for kind of stable, uh, more stable bonding. Um, for that cause, uh, people have been using very often the pyrene um, uh, derivatives in here. This is a pyrene butyric acid, which gives us the COH groups on the surface of graphene. The measurement is, is performed like this in here. This is a transfer characteristics of, of the graphene device uh, made uh, in a manual manner. Uh, we can see the gate voltage on the bottom here and the source drain, uh, volt, uh, sorry, source drain current. In here, uh, the source drain voltage is about 100 millivolts. What we do in this experiment, um, let me go through it with you. So we measure the bare device, which is the black curve. Um, and then we immerse the whole device into DMF, which is a common solvent for uh, pyrenes, uh, which are, again, those, those um, big organic molecules, um, hydrophobic. 
uh, this this only tail COOH group is hydrophilic. So they, they do not like water that much when it comes to solubility. They like DMF, for example. So we perform the measurement in DMF after immersing in DMF, and we can see that there is a huge shift from the black curve to the blue one. Um, this is most likely due to the um, uh, desorption of leftovers of PMMA. Um, and then afterwards, we immerse the, the whole device into DMF with pyrenes, and we can see some, some right shift in here. So from blue to red, um, it, it, there is a shift of, of uh, surface potential due to the absorption of pyrenes on the surface. Um, this is a, a transfer curve of graphene FET in a, in a linear scale of, of, of current. This here is in the logarithmic scale. Uh, so we can clearly see that, that our on-off ratio is a, from about 1.4 thousand microamps to like 300 microamps. So with a very simple uh, manual made device, we achieve about five, six um, on-off ratio. Very nice for in, in the field. Uh, when it comes to this, this curves, this, this lines in, the, in here, those are the um, leakage currents again. Uh, we can also show this, this uh, logarithmic scale um, graph like this. So those are our uh, source drain current here on the, on the top, and those in here are the leakage current. So despite the fact there is no passivation of electrodes whatsoever, the gold electrodes were not passivated with, passivated with the SU8, they do not exhibit that much of leakage current. Uh, it is at least 100 times lower than the actual source drain current um, stemming from the, the um, electron and hole transport in the graphene sheet itself. So uh, to sum up this slide, um, the non-covalent functionalization of carbon nanotubes and graphene is, is possible with those pyrenes, uh, which preserves their electronic properties and pyrenes form somewhat a monolayer. There's still a debate on how do they exactly interact. There's a couple of, of papers on that um, and then uh, what I would like to uh, point out and, and underline, always make uh, control measurements because you can end up having a um, situation like, like this in here, uh, that the solvent itself uh, changes the, the, the surface of, of, a, of a clean Bayer device and not only, the, uh, not only the pyrene, not only the active ingredient in the, in the mix. So um, to sum up this, this part, the single sheet graphene field effect trans transistors are very nice and a are a little bit more complex, yet they offer new possibilities. I didn't mention that in here, but for example, since the graphene is directly exposed to the liquid, there can be some Faradayic processes uh, happening at the surface of graphene itself. So this is where, where we cross the, the border with electrochemistry, like this classical electrochemistry, uh, where the Faraday process uh, from, from redox, reaction, uh, redox reactions are taking place. So the measurements of the electrolyte gated FETs, GFETs here are possible, again, with some limited voltages, plus minus uh, 1.5 uh, volts, but also it allows for uh, in principle for measuring the carbon nanotube network FETs. This was not shown in here, but, uh, but I've been doing that in my previous work as well. And let's tackle just uh, two, three minutes about um, organic electrochemical transistors, since they are very interesting because they, they uh, act a little bit differently. They look um, similar to a electrolyte gated um, field effect transistors, but they, uh, they, their mechanism of work is a little bit different. So um, to, to introduce you a little bit, we need to talk about the aerial and the volumetric capacitance um, effects. So in those extended gate um, measurements and also in the electrolyte gate measurements, with single sheet graphene, we're having a solid electrode on a substrate and then our um, um, electrical double layer forms on this 
this, this solid um, interface. In the case of organic electrochemical transistors, we use organic semiconducting polymers that form a three-dimensional molecular um, structures. So the, the binding events the, 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 that change the characteristics of the, of the transistor can take place in the whole volume of the polymer, not only at the interface between the surface and the um, uh, solid uh, surface and the electrolyte. Uh, so the electrical double layer um, is in here on a molecular level rather than a surfacial lever. And uh, this has been shown also that it's very feasible, for example, for measuring the myocyte um, cell cultures. Uh, this was done by, by uh, the group of Professor Ingebrandt from um, Aachen. They shown that um, covering, um, covering the, the surface and connecting it to, covering the surface with some PWPSS and connecting some electrodes, we can grow on top uh, cardiomyocytes and we can record some very interesting signals like, in, uh, for example, spontaneous contractions of myocytes uh, with the use of this um, organic um, electrolyte, uh, electrochemical transistor. So to sum up this part uh, and then the whole presentations, uh, presentation and the FET biosensing is a re-emerging field with a lot of interesting aspects. Uh, we covered um, topics uh, from um, extended gate configuration through graphene FETs, so electrolyte gated configuration to the organic, organic electrochemical transistors. Um, and definitely, I can surely say that Amstrad Pico is feasible to, for measurements and that the commercialization is possible. Uh, and again, there is no point of care device on the market yet. Uh, I've shown today that the multiplexing with the Amstrad Pico Max 16 uh, is possible and I, I encourage you to, to use that because then you get more statistically relevant um, data and you can get more uh, firm conclusions. Uh, organic electrochemical single sheet graphene FETs are still underexplored. There are lots of different um, aspects to that. Uh, I'm honestly, uh, this is my, my main topic of research interest uh, so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm very keen on those, those graphene FETs. Uh, organic electrochemical uh, transistors offer a little bit different possibilities, but uh, for example, in cell culturing or tissue culturing, uh, which still can advance, um, for example, drug testing. Uh, this is the acknowledgments and thank you for your kind attention. I'd like to acknowledge again, Mahit, Lutz and Brendan, uh, from PalmSense and my, my fabulous uh, smart um, bachelor uh, student, Maria Wrubleska, uh, which she made the, the, her bachelor thesis in collaboration with PalmSense. Um, and again, thank you again for your kind attention. Yeah, thank you, Martin. That was uh, really, I think that was also a lot to think about, and I already see like a lot of questions have popped up. Um, right, I think Adi is already looking at which questions we should answer very soon. So don't forget to upvote the questions in the Q&A section that you would like to see. Uh, also, just a small uh, remark, you will get after this webinar, you will get a short questionnaire. Uh, please, uh, please fill this in so we can learn something. We already try to, um, yeah, implement a lot of the feedback that we got the last time. So thank you for everybody who actively contributed at that time. And thank you to everyone who will contribute. So Artie, what questions are we looking forward to? Yeah, let's divide the questions a bit in the time they have been asked. Um, because I see there were questions marching about the beginning of your setup and they're related sheet seven and eight. So let's go there first if you could. Yeah, the question is the gate is the gold electrode. Is that correct? Is it the silver, silver chloride electrode? Is it grounded as well? So the extended gate is the uh, gold electrodes, as, as we've seen, for example, I believe, in here. So this is this scheme in here. 
So the uh, gate terminal of the commercially available MOSFET is connected to a uh, conducting surface in here, the gold surface. And this surface is immersed in the electrolyte where the reference electrode is also connected. The reference electrode and the whole setup is grounded, yes. I hope that, right, that thank this, you. Yeah, that <laughs> this helps. Answer the question. And if you could go to sheet eight, uh, Martin. Yes, of course. There are two questions there as well. Uh, first one is what is the thickness of the uh, gold layer? Uh, so I normally use um, glass substrates, and on glass substrates, I first sputter or evaporate 10 nanometers of titanium as the adhesion layer. And then on top of that, about 100 nanometers of gold layer, so that it's um, completely covered and, and homogeneous, and, and uh, there's only gold um, at the surface, and it's, it's continuous, so to say. There is no pinholes and, and so on. All right, great. And now you have, uh, uh, we have slide eight open anyway. We see a bit uh, on the graph, we see a bit of noise on the right end. Could you explain a bit uh, what it is? Yes. So, um, all the measurements apart from the slides with the Faraday's cage were done without the Faraday's cage. So that means that we pick up some, some 50 hertz noise. And this is rather difficult to eliminate without the Faraday's cage, obviously. Um, but still, it's feasible for measurements of extended gate in the field effect transistors. What we do in here is we can simply um, interpolate this subthreshold slope, let me pull out the laser pointer. We can uh, interpolate this subthreshold slope uh, with a function, and then uh, the, the noise is rather not relevant to, to our whole curve shift. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, yeah, just maybe to point out here, we do not have increased noise. Uh, it's a constant amount of noise, but this is a logarithmic scale. So the same oh, yes, yes. absolute amount of noise looks a lot bigger uh, on a logarithmic scale in the area where the current gets a lot uh, smaller. So don't forget this current is going through multiple magnitudes. Of yes, that's, that's correct. And then, then and you can see it's about 10 to the minus 8 um, amps. So this is what the uh, 10, uh, 10 nano amps uh, current here for um, such a very cheap and, and a mobile device as MSAT Pico. Uh, I believe this is still viable and, and feasible for uh, measurements. Um, yeah, Martin, while we're talking about Faraday cages anyway, uh, Paul Durant Esteve asked, like, why uh, is putting are you putting transistors in a Faraday cage? Why is it so important? Well, there are very long and unshielded cables. That's in one of your other slides, yes. I think. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. yes, uh, you can see the, the whole setup in here. Um, so there's this MSAT Pico Max in, in, um, in here. And then there's this here in my, my measurement board. But you can see one single USB-C cable coming out of here, right? Um, and if, if you look closely onto the slide number seven, the whole measurement setup and the MSAT Pico Max device is in the Far East cage. There's just this one cable and one tube, piece of tubing here uh, that are going into the Faraday's cage. So, so basically whole, you, have, you have like two Faraday cages, let's say. Uh, basically my both instruments and the measurement setup and the electrochemical cell are inside the Faraday's cage. There's just the USB-C cable uh, going out of here and connecting to the computer in here. Um, I'm, I might need a laser pointer. So, I'm the, so the cable USB-C is here, right? And then it goes to the computer in here. Yeah, and that's yeah, it. No, that's, the yeah, whole no, that's thing cool. is is inside. Yeah, and and that's on, why we get slides. some some uh, lesser uh, lesser current for noise. Yeah, I see. And on the slides before that, so where you saw the uh, the other, could you show the other photo, uh, Martin? Yes. The one on the uh, six. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yes, you one. can see it here. Uh, this is uh, the the only cable that that goes out of the Faraday's cage. All of those uh, case, uh, cables, I agree, they are not made 
properly. Uh, this is a, a improvisation. This is a, a prototype, so to say, but it works. So yeah, and then, uh, going you, from here, we can expand and, and definitely uh, enhance. Yeah, and if you go to the left top uh, margin of this sheet, you see also uh, oh, this, yeah, this one on the left top. Yes, also mentioned this is, that this was like a Faraday cage, but yes, this this will be somewhat, the second one. This somewhat works as a Faraday cage, but I I, I still, I mean, it's it's a more like a precaution so that the uh, MOSFETs do not get um, any signals, any not picking any signals and not being like, um, for example, flooded with some electrolyte um, or something like that. All right, great. Um, then a, a question from Vladimir Bem. And he's asking uh, questions about the um, setup with the multiplexer with the 16 uh, MOSFETs. Uh, he's asking, why do 16 MOSFETs show different results? Uh, yeah. So basically, um, the MOSFETs are made in in thousands uh, quantities. They're um, the industrial scale, and they can differ a little bit. Um, so as you can see in here, this is uh, a measurement in, in a, a logarithmic scale in here, uh, 16 devices. Um, then the measurement is done in an alternating way. They all somehow oscillate between, uh, you see 10 to, the, uh, 10 to the power of 0 0.2 to the 10 to the power of minus 0 0.4. If you take a look at the transfer curves that were made um, previous, I mean, before the, the measurement, because you need to make them transfer curves in order to get the subthreshold swing function. Uh, this function allows you to recalculate this current into the voltage shift. And this voltage shift is our actually signal, analytical signal. That means that we still normalize it uh, to the, to the um, each, MOSFET is normalized to itself, reference to itself. So we get the relative signal change and the relative signal change in the logarithmic scale as shown in here is more or less the same. So you see that the distance here from this yeah. point to this point, this point to this point, those are more or less similar. This is a very robust experiment. Uh, just the gold, uh, bare gold, gold surface with some absorption, non-specific absorption of bovine serum albumin on top. Yeah, all right, thank you. Um, a question about GFETs. Dimitrios mm -hmm. uh, Simatos is asking like, is the GFET stable over time? Is the leakage current increasing, uh, increasing with time? Uh, from what I, what I measured, let's, let's go to the slides that we're referring to. From what I measured, the leakage current um, in time and the um, and the the GFET transfer curve itself, um, after initial stabilization, I would say after about 20, 30 minutes of, of immersion, uh, the the signal does not shift anymore. So the the transfer curve does not shift anymore. It needs a little bit of stabilization time. That's that's true. Uh, but afterwards, if you uh, measure it several times you can see that, that the curves are on top of each other. So I accounted already for that. Those are all the measurements, all the results that I'm showing are after the initial stabilizations. Uh, so basically measured every several minutes, like every five minutes, uh, when uh, until I see that the, the, um, the drift kind of saturated and, and, and there's um, the transfer curves are on top of each other. All right, thank you. Uh, just out of curiosity, I have a question like, because you make these semiconductors manually, basically. Yes. Um, what's your yield? Like is every, every one that you make is working or is it like one out of 10 or is it like one out of 10 is thrown out or? Uh... So with, with my current experience and um, I, I'd say years of doing that, uh, I'm getting like 95% yield, uh, which is pretty good, I would say, um, for such a manual, easy and robust process. Obviously, um, if we want to make it into a, 
commercial product, the, the process needs to be automated somehow. And the process needs to be less dependent on the, on the user. But to make the point, the proof of concept studies uh, with some chemistry, with some surface modification, with some assay development, a biosensor development, this is good enough to, to show those um, effects. All right, thank you. Um, another one from uh, Vladimir Kutner. He's asking uh, also about multiplexing. Why do you need as many as 16 transistors in uh, for multiplexing and wouldn't just 16 electrodes uh, and one transistor suffice? Uh, hello, Professor Kutner. <laughs> Professor Kutner is, is from my, my institute and he's a well-known uh, person in electrochemistry. Uh, thank you for your kind question. Uh, yes, it is possible to, to connect the, all of them to one uh, transistor, but then we're a little bit limited when it comes to the opening and closing time of the transistor. Uh, if we're having 16 separate transistors, we're able to address them separately. When we're having one transistor and then the MUX that switches 16 different um, extended gates, it poses a little bit uh, of a problem uh, when it comes to timing, the right timing um, of the measurement. All right, so that's we're clear. limited by the by the MOSFET uh, MOSFET um, part, so to say. Okay. Having better MOSFETs would be better. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, another question about the interface, uh, the graphene electrolyte interface. Uh, yes. Which critical Faraday processes did you observe at the graphene and electrolyte interface? Um, there is a very nice um, publication um, by a group from, I believe, TU Berlin. Um, they made um, some graphene field effects transistors where, and, and they added some redox active molecules to the electrolyte uh, in a changing um, concentration. And they observe the shift of the transfer curve of this, this, this minimum of the transfer curve with the addition of redox active molecules. Um, that said, we can imagine that um, putting the GFET into a real sample, for example, serum or blood, where there's a lot of, of, of um, endogenous redox active molecules like uric acid or ascorbic acid can interfere with the, uh, with the graphene field effect transistors. So we need to assess and, and always account for other processes that can happen at the graphene. And what I recommend is always make lots of controls, positive, negative controls, to be sure that your signal is actually coming from the interaction you're looking into. All right, thank you. Um, we still have a bit of time, but we're only going to answer three more questions. So please, if you would like to upload your favorite question, then we were going to answer these. Um, this is actually one for you, Lutz. Um, what is the difference between the MC Pico Max and the MC Pico, uh, the normal MC Pico, or maybe the development kit? Uh, not much. <laughs> so um, now there's the, there's the difference. So the Amstead Pico development kit is um, is really focused on the Amstead Pico. There is um, a, a Bluetooth radio on it. There's an SD card on it, so that you can, for a single channel, or actually the dual channel or bipotensistat system, do. Um, everything immediately out of the box. So you take it, you connect it, and you use it. Um, the multiplexer is the Amstead Pico soldered onto the multiplexing board. And um, if I remember correctly, that multiplexing board is only the multiplexer. Um, that means a multiplexer, just to maybe be clear on that point, is a series of switches that allows to connect your potentiostat, which is still one potentiostat, to multiple cells, as Marcin has shown. So, um, but that also means that usually you only control one set of electrodes. There are some tricks to expand that a bit, but in principle, you control one set of electrodes. Um, so even when you do what Marcin shows as the alternating mode, where you make a point of every channel, and then you do the second point of every channel, uh, that's still not a parallel measurement. It's still point one of channel one, point one of channel two. So there's a time difference between them. Um, and, I, and I say like the difference is with the MUX16, 
you get the multiplexer with it and um, yeah, and with the um, MZ Pico development kit, you get like the Bluetooth radio, SD card, et cetera, with it. But actually, Adi, I think you might uh, be actually maybe more familiar with the uh, Mach 16 than I am for the MZ Pico as an OEM product. Yeah, but no worries, you explained it well. Yeah. Uh, so let's go to the next question. And that's for you, Mar Martin. If you could go to uh, slide nine of your presentation. And then the question is, uh, what is the tile chemical that you're using? And what is the chain length? Oh, uh, so this is referring maybe to the previous slide here, the proof of concept studies. So in here, uh, I was using the, actually Maria, my, my uh, bachelor student, was using the uh, MUA, so the Mercapto undecanoic acid. Uh, so it has, a, what, 10 uh, carbons? Undecanoic, so 11. <laughs> 11 carbons, a, a COH group um, at the end. And then at the other end, there is a, there is a tile uh, that can absorb or, or interact or, or bond to, 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 to the gold surface. All right, thank you. And, and then the last question, um, why don't you use uh, carbon nanotubes uh, or carbon nanotubes FETs that have a higher on-off ratio instead of graphene? Who said uh, I don't use them? <laughs> um, well, I have I have a little bit um, slide in here. Let me show you. So I in, in my previous work I was also using some carbon nanotube networks made from sorted semiconducting carbon nanotubes, where I um, use the electrical field alignment, uh, basically applying some voltage to the two electrodes and the carbon nanotubes do align within the electric field lines. Um, this is a AFM picture of such a, um, such a device on the top and on the bottom. You can see the two stripes. Those are the gold electrodes, uh, the interdigitated gold electrodes, and those little white here are single nanotubes. They form a network in here and uh, you can measure them. I mean, you can connect the source chain um, terminals and then a good, um, and then a, and a AGA GCL gate um, electrode and measure them in a similar manner with the in an electrolyte gated FET configuration. Uh, in here, you can see the uh, the transfer curve. The gate voltage is in here. The gate voltages do not exceed one volt in here. Uh, the currents go from 10 to the minus five to down to um, single nanoamps of current. So yes, I agree. The, the on-off ratio in here is way, way higher. Um, and it's also ambipolar behavior. And again, upon addition of some, some uh, charged species, the transfer curve shifts to the positive and negative potentials uh, or negative potentials. Um, I've done actually a, a whole by a sensor on top of that, by using some, some nanobodies uh, for green fluorescent protein uh, in a similar manner to my graphene um, paper that I, um, I also recommend to you to, to, to take a look at. Um, this is a little bit about the, the surface modification itself. I used again the pyrene chemistry, but in here the pyrene chemistry with some polyethylene glycol um, as mentioned in the previous um, seminar, it allows for measurements in physiological buffers. And uh, in here, I show the comparison about, of two um, assays uh, with and without the uh, additional polyethylene glycol layer using nanobodies as our receptor. We can see that we can get the um, qualitative, uh, quantitative results um, immunosensing in high ionic strength um, buffers. So in short, yes, I do use carbon nanotubes <laughs> uh, for my research. And I'm switching um, between graphene and carbon nanotubes. My latest idea is actually to combine the both of, of them to, to have some added value. Um, so yes, thank you. But if graphene field effect transistors and CNT field effect transistors get in a bar fight, who wins? Um, 
I'm voting for carbon natives. Despite that most of my activities concern the graphene, I'm voting carbon nanotubes because they can be very easily printed. Uh, with current graphene technology, there is there are some papers on the on the roll to roll transfer of graphene, but this is like a single paper from from Samsung, I believe, from 2011 or something. Uh, whereas for semiconducting carbon nanotubes. There are already a handful of papers where the researchers use either aerosol or inkjet printing of those carbon nanotubes on top of some, some substrate, and they already get the transistors in, in a very high quantity and very high quality. Where, where, whereas for graphene, uh, well, the, the process is still um, semi-manual at least. So the carbon nanotubes will get to the, the, the market faster, I believe. And as far as I remember, there is a, a one field effect transistor um, out there commercially available made from carbon nanotubes already. Uh, this is more like a, a alternative to a MOSFET as a switch or as, as an amplifier, but there is already one carbon nanotube network field effect transistor out there for, um, um, for sale. Okay, great. Um, and Adi, this is this is all the time we have for questions today, right? Okay, so just before we leave, just see if I can manage to do this. Uh, I want to share one more slide, um, which is our special offer that we're running due to this webinar. So maybe you got curious about the Emstead Pico Mark 16 or the Amstead Pico in general, and want to start with the Amstead Pico Development Board, um, you can go to our website, have a look at them, and you can get a 10% discount for them if you request a quote before April 16th. Um, you just go to our website, and when you um, request a quote, fill in the comment section, uh, FET-Webinar, that's a promo code, and you can get a 10% discount. Um, just because we want to motivate a lot of people to try field effect based sensors with our devices. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share that real quick with, uh, with you. And yeah, I think this is, this is it for today. So I can only thank everyone for participating. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Adi, for making sure everybody gets heard and all the questions get asked. And of course, thank you, Martin, for the great presentation and answering the questions that I consider today like on a quite high level. Um, so uh, yes, yeah, so thanks everyone. And uh, yeah, see you next time. Maybe Martin wants to say some words for goodbye. Yes, thank you again for, for allowing me to uh, present the, my work to the wider audience. Um, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you all for watching my, my seminar. Um, I hope that, that I, I got you interested in the field effect transistor uh, fields. I am aware that I'm actually creating a little bit of competition for myself. But on the other hand, we're all um, scientists and we're doing it for the greater good of, of mankind. So I, and I believe that's very, very honestly. And, and um, yeah, let's. Let's pursue the, the scientific progress more. Thank you very much again, and um, have a nice day. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>